A big thank you to CivilNet Studios in downtown Yerevan for providing a studio to Wine Talks with Paul K. That's civilnet.am. Carson. Leno. Fallon. Now, it's Wine Talks with Paul K. Hey, welcome to Wine Talks with Paul K. And we are on an away game today in the heart of Yerevan, Armenia. About to have a conversation with the great Vahe Kushkarian. Introductions in just a moment. Wine Talks, of course, available on iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, wherever you hang out for podcasting. And this episode is sponsored by Total Wine and More, where you find what you love and love what you find. Distilled spirits not available in Virginia, New Hampshire, and must be 21 to buy wines there. But this is a fascinating conversation for me, and I'm so happy to have Vahe Kuskarian to the to the Wine Talk show again. Welcome to the show. Pleasure. This Thanks is for you know, me. I was telling Connor the story before you came in. You visited uh, California, I don't know, it was a few years ago, right? We came? And we, yeah, we... I mean, I, I saw you first time, maybe 20 some years ago. Yeah, I know. And then, <laughs> that's very, very, like, let's not go that deep. Uh, and then probably three, four years ago. Yeah, yeah so you walked in. Again, yeah. You walked in. There's two parts of that story. One, one you just said, which is we realized we had done business together. And you, yeah. I bought some Gallo, I think, Sonoma wine from you, right? Is that what you were no, saying? No, I bought from you. I think. Oh, you bought it for yeah, me? I oh, yeah, I for, for a wedding, some shit. Yeah, that's Gallo, right. Second label, Gallo Chardonnay or something. And then, uh, but and then also, you bought, you probably, of course, bought wine from me too on a second occasion. So yes, I, I think don't so. Know, probably the Italian wine at the time. I was Were you running Italian the wine. restaurant then? Uh, no, I was past the restaurant. No. Past that after. Yeah, pa- it was way after. It must have been mid 90s, late 90s. Yeah. Like that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that same day, uh, here we had a connection and then we got on camera we spoke and then we spoke longer there was this group of people that were waiting for me that wanted to look into buying that property that you were visiting and i was so in- intrigued with your conversation and what you had done that they got pissed off and left <laughs> <laughs> i may have blown a wholesale <laughs> but, but you were so interesting and i and i came over and i told my wife i said that was one of the most interesting winemakers i've ever interviewed and and I think a lot has to do with your exper- your broad market experience in the wine world. So right. tell me a little about it. you. You were in Italy. I know that. Was that the first part of the wine, or was it Berkeley? Uh, no, uh, I got into wine right after restaurants in Berkeley. I had a restaurant in Berkeley for five years, and then of course the restaurant I left it to my brother-in-law, my best friend. He continued on. I was it was too suffocating for me. I wanted to. Travel. I had been to Italy already. I was, had this, uh, you know, yearning to go back to Italy. So uh, I knew uh, restaurants and I knew wine because I was a wine buyer for the restaurant. So I thought, why not be an agent and export Italian wines? I spoke Italian fluently, so it was a natural. So uh, we packed and went to Italy. I mean, first I got into the wholesale business in California. Yes, I bought an existing distributor. Um, continued doing uh, mostly Italian and French wines, and I moved to Italy. And then there, it kind of followed, got vineyards, winery, two wineries, Tuscany, Puglia. Then I came to Armenia in 97. That was like another phase. I got land, vineyards, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's my trajectory of how I got into the wine business. That's, you know, that's quite varied and quite interesting because this is, our industry is a tough industry and you've done amazing things with what you've done here and things that would make other winemakers and people in this business, uh, to, to raise an eyebrow and say, wow, you know, how's he pulling this off? I mean, really when it comes down to it, but under, it seems like understanding the restaurant business in, in the diaspora, so to speak, or in America, understanding the wholesale side of that business, which is a completely different part of our business. And then going into manufacturing in Italy, I mean, this is pretty rounded stuff. Um, what were you doing in Puglia? Puglia was doing, um, I realized Tuscany, I was a touch late. <clears throat> I started there in 94, so it had already moved. It well, the, pre- the prices were depressed, yeah. but there was some action. There were um, some winemakers already making, uh, but Puglia was still in the backyards. And I realized a lot of wine in Tuscany came from Puglia at night. 
to fix them up. <laughs> that's yeah. true. <laughs> yeah. So I realized, okay, that's the real, the real place to be. And I went. I was one of the earliest ones. Actually, my wine was the highest rated ever in Parker at ninety four points. Uh, the Ray. From, wow. For, yeah, it was. What were you growing there? Uh, Negromaro? Uh, Primitivo and Negromaro. Primitivo and Negromaro. The Primitivo. coastal area Primitivo. I didn't have vineyards. I used to buy grapes from farmers. Yeah. And uh, and uh, inland more towards Leche, that area, uh, Negromaro. So the Ray was a blend of those two. Was that was that when Puglia, which for the listeners is the you know, the heel of the boot basically in Italy, was that part? When it was sort of still sort of a bulk wine environment, where there you know the the quality hadn't really been recognized yet. Yes, Puglia had always been. Actually, if you go to near the train stations in some of the towns, you will see names like Folonari, Antinori in Puglia, but they're not used anymore. The warehouses because that was the source for a lot of their wines. Uh, same for southern France. You know, a lot of bulk wine was shipped from because hard. Really? It's wow. yes. The problem was at the time they had to take the wine early because there was no it's warm region, no refrigeration, no cooling. So the the wines would spoil very fast. So all of the wine had this terroir smell, which yes. was <laughs> which was funky, funky yes, wine that. making. But you know, it was terroir or whatever. Yeah. Nothing had it's like bad. Dirty you hit it behind terroir. Yeah, dirty, okay. dirty, <laughs> dirty hoses, whatever. So by the time I got there, it was already a sharp refrigeration system. I bought French uh, brand new stainless steel tanks and whatnot. And I mean, modern style wine. Uh, so that was the second phase. of, And Puglia was really exciting. It was, you know, no man's land. You could do whatever you wanted in, wow. a, in, a, in the sense that find grapes, whatever you wanted. There wasn't much pushing and shoving like, Tuscany, let's say, you know. When was that? What year was that? Oh, oh exactly. I would say it was 99. Really? 99 okay, was so my still... first vintage. 94 was my first. I moved to Italy in 94. 96 was my first vintage, vintage in Tuscany. And 99 was my first vintage. And 2000, I opened the winery. So wow. 2000, 2001, uh, uh, you know, until. Were you married then? I was married, yeah. But My wife, kids, so uh, kids you know. Then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Puglia, we didn't live. So we would summer or go in the summer or I would just go back and forth, you know. From? But uh, from Tuscany. Okay. I was living in Florence. Florence. So, yeah, yeah. So the bottling, everything was done in Florence. I mean, in Tuscany. Oh, really? Yes. So the bulk came and we bottled it there. And actually, I did quite well. Opened a lot of European markets with the wow. Puglia wines more than the Tuscan one. Tuscan was tough. You know, if you come late into the game, it's sure. really hard. Armenia is the same now. You know, those who came started early, invested, boom, boom. You know, now they have they have they built brands. So you go to any restaurant, you will see certain brands always on the tables. Now there's a lot of newcomers, and they have to catch up. You know, they have to throw a lot of money in marketing, they have the advertising and this and that to get an edge. Is that kind of what, uh, let's just take the worldwide view of wine. You, you experienced it, you, yeah. did it in tu- you did it in Puglia, which is great, and Tuscany, yes, is well-established, and you're competing with established brands and expensive land and expensive planning things. Napa Valley, I mean, <laughs> try, try and start a winery in Napa yeah. Valley today. Yeah. It, it, the founders are the ones that are making the money. But that sounds like maybe that's what our that's what wine is really. You chase, you chase these new places and, and be the first verse to the market. And is that what drove you to Armenia then? That we thought. Yeah, look, Armenia was a chance, uh, you know, uh, a risk. Uh, no, it was chance. I came as a tourist, and then somehow uh, between talking to people, I figured that this is where everything started. By nature, I'm a romantic. I can't. It's like I was a, like a kid in a candy store. Like, wow, oh, this is where it started thousands of years ago. Wow. And I had just done Tuscany. It's not like I had uh, lots of money or cash. I had lots of passion. Yes. So I came. Up to a year later, we I leased 50 hectares. 50 hectares. Leased land, 50 hectares. Hectares in, in Vajotzor. You know, so we did that. Uh, I planted vineyard the year after. I did lots of crazy stuff. It didn't take because it was, I just didn't have that kind of capital to pull it off. Yeah. Now my local partner 
put more cap, put money in it, this, that, the other. It was like, okay, it, it completely went out of hand. And then I came back in 2009. In the meantime, every once a year, I would come, check out the vineyards, what's going on, this, that. 2009, I came for my children to learn Armenian. We got a gap year, very American thing to do. And I came, I chance meeting with Ernekian. He had planted. Oh, really? Yeah, he had planted vineyards three years before. And this was the first harvest. I said, wow, give me some grapes. Let me see what we can do. Uh, six barrels of wine. And that's how Garas was born. And Garas was born and the whole Armenian industry moved. And so it was kind of a you know, chain reaction. And now we find ourselves 12, 13 years later, an uh, uh, industry that's unrecognizable 10 years ago, let's say. So you started with Karas? Yes, I Karas. was a Karas project, yeah. Um, I did the packaging, labeling, design, everything was started. I did it early on, marketing, distribution, managing, except the vineyards, I managed everything else. That's fascinating. I didn't know that. I, yeah. remember, I, I Maybe I did knew, uh, the gleaning of that, but I didn't yeah. know that. And I've had fabulous conversations with Juliana, I think, a brilliant yeah. young woman, uh, particularly yeah. you know, running in an industry that's so dominated by men. Um, but I didn't know that that's where you started all this. Yes. Um, but clearly, your experience in Italy, uh, in the hospitality side, in America, uh, in the wholesale side, which is a whole different world we've discussed, uh, prepared you for this. I mean, this th that experience, walking into a brand new environment of Armenian wine, you had some depth of experience to to have sure. some idea what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, I, I had been at it already. Uh, enough experience, let's put it this way. Uh, wine making is not an Armenian thing. Just because wines are very, uh, wine and wines are very rooted product, and you can't move with them. And because Armenians move a lot, yes. we're kick, being kicked out of- We're nomads. One, uh, yeah, basically with some country we're hosts, they, they are with hospital, you know, we come as a guest, we stay 30, 40, 50 years, <laughs> then civil war, this, that we get kicked, and right. that's our story. So if you're in the wine business, it's stupid. You have to be an engineer, doctor, anything, uh, a profession. Uh, you can take that with you, and that's what happens. Jewelers, millions of, we have a lot of them. We have lots of doctors. We have, why make us like we can, you and I can maybe count, not Armenia excluding, which is homeland, right. but let's say diaspora, either Fresno, raising, yeah, the, raising the growers, Lebanon, nobody. There's nobody handful, made right. wine in Lebanon, Syria, nothing. Maybe Western Armenia at the time, probably, but not fine wine. They grew grapes for raisin or fermented the juice. Right. Stuff. So that is the whole picture. So I, as Vahe, knew more than most anybody else in the wine business, right. unless, you, like you, you were in the commercial side, right. but production. So relatively, when I came to Armenia, I brought a lot of knowledge with me, yeah. experience with me about distribution, about about the rules, uh, label approvals, uh, colas, all of that, the uh, three-tier system, that came very naturally to me. And I had already been buying from Europe. So all of that came with me here, and it was virgin land, tabula rasa, let's go. And that's what happened. And that's fascinating. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, you do. This is a slow industry. You only get one chance a year, right? And so, if you can yeah. circumvent some of the headwinds because you, because you made the mistakes already, you made yeah. some mistakes in America. Lots, lots. You made mistakes yes, yes, America. everywhere. Yeah. I'm still and, making and, them. And you can shortcut that, even though you know the Armenian mentality is, I know better than you, and I can yeah. see that embedded in some of the people that are here, and they're not going to listen to those conversations because why do I need you? What do you know, right? I mean, that's, I hate to say it that way, but that's kind of the way it is. There are, there are a handful of Armenian winemakers in America, and I have some good friends that, that you know, love the industry and are trying to make changes. One of them, I would love to ha have you meet her. She lives in Napa. Her name is Sharon Kazan, Kazanjian Harris. And no, she, I don't know about her. She's fabulous. And she, she has the guts to pour Bordeaux in a Napa Valley tasting room. Oh, you know? okay. So that's, a, <laughs> that's what it takes. How, how important then, because you brought this up, uh, re in regards to we're nomads, uh, we get overrun all the time, there's all kinds of civil war, but there's a lot of press about Adani 1 and the fact that the, it's the oldest intact winery, et cetera, et cetera. We're going there tomorrow. I, I, how can I come to Armenia and not go see sure. this, right? But how important is that 
history and the story to tell people in the world of marketing wine here. Look, as a narrative, um, there's two aspects to it. One is the narrative part. It's the marketing part, let's say. Uh, that's the the story, the narrative, the 11, now it's 11,000 years, it's not only 6,000, 11,000 years ago, this part of the world where it was domesticated. So mm-hmm. uh, this was written up maybe four months ago in a science magazine. Oh. Uh, yes, so now we are to 11,000 years is where this part of the world were domesticated, uh, I guess, the Vitis vinifera or the wine grapes as we know it. So there's that narrative. But the more important part is why. Why is it that 11,000 years ago, 8 or 6 or 7,000 years ago, the vine flourished here? Mm-hmm. And that is the most important because if I'm going to... If I'm going to go to Germany to sell wine, I can't just tell the story. And then the guy will say, wonderful, beautiful. But I have to continue to say why. Because the wine, the grape here, it's, it's a natural habitat. That's why it, it, it flourished here. Mm-hmm. Because of the soil, mm-hmm. the high elevation, the volcanic soil, the minerality and the high acidity make the wine uh, age. Mm-hmm. It doesn't spoil like there is in the new world, let's say. Here, wines are made, we don't add any kind of acid. The only time you have to add acid to wines in Armenia is you're using non-Armenian grapes, like Chardonnay. Mm-hmm. You cannot make Chardonnay in Armenia in a traditional vineyards without Acidulating. adding. Yes, we have to, because it, it was designed for Champagne and Burgundy. Mm-hmm. It wasn't designed for Armenian lands. Here, but the other, our varieties, Voskehat, let's say, Voskehat and other white varieties, we harvest the same time with the reds. You know, Chardonnay, here you blink, in August you have to harvest right. because it's a precocious grape. It's very fast. So the, the logic here to buy Armenian wine is that we have three things that are unique. One is that we have high elevation vineyards. We start around 950 and we go to 1800 meters. That's around 6,000 meters. That's a mile. For the Northern Hemisphere, maybe there's one piece of handkerchief vineyard in Colorado that's higher. Otherwise, Armenia takes the cake at that high elevation. Of course, you know, polyphenols at those elevations are very different than sea level. So we have a wine that's also uh, aromas, color, phenols, and that kind of stuff. Structure. And, uh, absolutely. And then we have the volcanic soil, not clay. When you have volcanic soil well-drained, the root is chasing the water nonstop. So you have roots that go uh, deep to bring out you know, nutrients and minerals. So you have a healthy, uh, healthy vine. Then you add the indigenous varieties. Now I think we're around 100 varieties that are fingerprinted, dna and we know there's a dendrogram showing which varieties are the parents, how it came about, which ones are crossed. It's beautiful. It's amazing if you look at it. And that's a snapshot into enological history of seven, eight, ten thousand 10,000 years of crossing, genetic uh, mm-hmm. mutation, and so on and so forth. So you have all of this. So that is why Armenian wine is Armenian. End of story. So those three are the reason that we have these deep wines, not count, not taking into consideration that the vineyards we inherited from Soviet times are really all over the place. It's mosaic. They have 10 varieties in. We have eating grapes because the farmer wanted to eat some, that kind of stuff, you know? So now, now we're getting into this next phase where now we have more high, uh, higher density plantings, clonal selection. So now we will start in a two, three, four, five, ten years, let's say. We're going to make RNAs that are very different than the RNAs that we have now because the the clones were selected and so on and so forth. So now we're getting into the next phase. So the next ten years is vineyard time, not wine. Wineries here, we have it down to Every shining stainless mm-hmm. steel, every winery has bottling mm-hmm. lines. Somehow there's capital. Every, every, pretty much any winery you walk into now, things shine. Technologies are exactly, which is so, enough. So, but enough that's yet. not enough at all. And now we're realizing, like Garas Ernekian did it the right way. They started from the vineyards, then the wine. They start with cognac. Wine was not in the picture. After we 
played with it, then wine became the main thing, and cognac is minimized now. And they started the right way. Zora started the right way. They planted vineyards. Uh, Vedi Alco started the right way. Armenia wine started the right mix. Armenia wine started making wine, plus started con in parallel planting vineyards. So now we are in the, that phase where a lot of people are planting new vineyards. And you, that, know, the, the, you said something important, though. This 11,000 years, let's just call it 11,000 yeah. years. You know, under normal circumstances, there'd be a lot of experience behind this, and hopefully uh, some of those stories would have rolled forward, even in modern times. Yeah. Uh, the Soviets interrupted all this, because when we were here in 2006, it's been established that the wines were undrinkable, to the point when I, I went home to, yeah. to and researched Adani, because I didn't even believe it to be Vitis vinifera, and for the listeners, that means of the highest level of winemaking grapes, rather than uh, Vitis lambrusca or something like that. And they are Venice Vinifera, but they certainly didn't taste like it. And now you brought the technologies, which you, which are great. Mm -hmm. But when do we find out? And I think Michelle Roland told uh, Juliana at, at Caras, we'll know in 100 years. And you're saying because we'll it takes, what? you'll uh, know what, what's going to be produced and the nuances of Adani and the different grapes in Armenia are going to produce. And, you you know, it takes, what, 20 years probably to to understand uh, how this volcanic soil and the clonal selections are going to affect the wine. Uh, well, let's start from, it takes six years to get wine quality okay, grapes. So let's go first 10. Vintage. Let's go, yeah. Like good vintage would be six years after okay. you plant the vineyard. Right. Let's go a little bit more, 10. Another two years of winemaking, three, four. So 20 is now, look where we came from, almost vinegar to not world-class wines, but good. quite good Drink or very good, good or wines. almost very nice wines. Yeah. Some world-class. We have a couple of Bloomberg's in the making in yeah, the last right. couple of years. So we're going in that direction. Mm -hmm. So we have to add another 20 years to see. What maybe Michel Roland uh, or others might be referring to is to uh, fine-tune every parcel of land that we have in Armenia. And that is, we are way far away. Yeah. We can, uh, the first phase we, we, it will be, is that we will do it mostly for Vyotsor, which is the most interesting because it's 12 villages, all south-facing, all hills, more like Burgundy or mm -hmm. Piemonte, let's mm -hmm. say. Yeah? Uh, conceptually, that's where we are in Vyotsor. That's the first that can be, let's say, uh, affirmed and uh, then uh, origin kind of done work for a uh, denomination, let's say. But to get into vineyard level or parcel level like there is in Burgundy, we're talking 100 years at least. Yeah. That, that Maybe even less. Even less because now information is accessible to all. Capital is accessible to all. Burgundy, for example, it took two, three hundred years, but not much change for two hundred years. It's no. not like the you know champagne to the change. story of champagne until from ninety percent of the bottles exploding. Yes, right. You know, as, uh, you know, because the sugar was too much. Uh, uh, so and they deal and they used to work with masks instead uh, two two-day champagne. It wasn't many years ago. No. You know, but because there was nothing for them, they didn't know there was no chemistry, there was no biology, there was no microbiology, none of it. Now it's available. So we can speed up the, t the time we'll compress. So 100, 200 is exaggeration. But we, I will put money that within the next 10 to 15 years, we will have world-class wines, world-class wines in Armenia. So Just because I'm starting from the terroir concept. Right. If I wouldn't be able to say the same for Georgia. Not because I like or don't like Georgia. Georgia is because it's sea level and clay. So it's not like, and they have been squeezing that lemon yeah, they can't to, to the most. You yes. can't squeeze any more yeah. because what are you going to do? In Armenia, we have so many elevations. We have so much to work with. And that's what will happen. And we have the raw material to do it. We were talking about um, the Malbecs. I had a French... Uh, winemaker in the shop, and he was telling the stories. He was been growing Malbec, which, uh, you know, uh, New World, S South America, and they're growing Malbec at, you know, 1,000 feet, 2,000, 3,000 to 5,000 feet, and they're getting dramatically different wines. 
uh, out of that because of the terroir. So when you say world class, you're talking about terroir driven wines, wines that reflect where they're from. Is Arani capable of that? Yes, uh, Arani is uh, will be if we do the clonal selection, Arani will be reaching those. The problem we've had with Arani is that it was always harvested too early. Yeah. So when it's too early, it's a bit green, it's a little bit black, yeah, it black too much black pepper and so on and so forth. Plus add to it bad winemaking, then it it wasn't. But within all of it, RNA was the king because the other ones were even worse. So you have to put things in relative context. So it is luckily hard to identify because if we said, oh, it's like Pinot Noir, then you know, it would, no, it's RNA. And RNA has the potential to become a big, and uh, it is uh, low tannin, almost no tannin yeah, this, variety. Yeah. Uh, it's just because that is the nature of it. Like Khandoni is the opposite of it. Khandoni is hard, hard like nails, tannic. Yeah. You know, and if you don't get it really mature, it's a tough one. You have to yeah. put in barrel, weight, aerate, and whatnot. With RNA, you don't have any of it. So RNA has the more delicate nuances and it's not in your face. So it's more like a Pinot Noir, it's more like a Sangiovese, it's more like a Nebbiolo without the tannins. Do we know Sa of its aging Sa potential? Have we made uh, We have don't, we, we have, we don't, I mean, we don't know. What's because, the oldest uh, wine you have in the uh, Yeah, nothing, it's uh, uh, from Arini's, uh, yeah, 10, we are not, no, yeah. no, no, we do uh, I mean, yeah, ten years made, old, 10 years old. made wine. Yeah, yeah, ten, probably 10 years old is the oldest example okay, so of, you yeah. uh, yeah. Uh, it could be Zora is from 2010 vintage. Uh, are any pure within Duet Garas at the time? I made in 13 was my first vintage for It doesn't Arrini. seem to like oak too much. Very oak. like used oak. You yeah. can't do, unless you go towards November and you harvest at around uh, 25 bricks, you get a wow, 15 yeah. alcohol, yeah. then you can throw new oak at it. But you have to be careful. Yeah. We don't use New York in Arini, or we do it very sparingly because it can overwhelm, especially local. Sirenia, yeah, that can take oak. You it can put it. that in two years and no problem at all. It loves oak. Yeah. Hey, let's take a break for our sponsor, Total Wine and More. There's always something new to try at Total Wine and More. I love this place. The other day I was in looking for a Napa Red and stumbled across the Prosecco aisle and had to buy this Prosecco that was fabulous for under $8.00. A great alternative to other types of sparkling wines. And then there's French Rosé that under $7, which is incredible. A huge selection of Kentucky Burby, Burby, bourbon. And with these low prices, I had to get both the wines that I was looking at. With the lowest prices over 30 years, always find what you love and love what you find at Total Wine and More. You can't buy spirits in Virginia or North Carolina. Please drink responsibly, and you must be 21 to purchase. That's Total Wine and More. Check it out. Back to the show. So you, you've done an amazing thing with your sparkling and cushion and the group Wineworks. What what inspired Wineworks? Because, you know, I don't think people understand. Listeners maybe that listen to the show once in a while uh, have heard that, you know, most wine in America is not bottled by the grower, probably 90% of it. You know, there's only 5% of the wine possibly is state grown and bottled. Uh, and Wineworks is a co-op. I'm not a co-op, but a, a custom it's an crush. incubator. A custom crush. Uh, yeah. Okay. How many people now are using? But usually, at any given time, I have around twelve projects in being incubated at different phases, uh, and then uh, oh, I have another. We have graduated another ten, maybe that I made wine for two years. Then they went there, opened their own winery. So we have a lot of those. Wow, that's great. So yes, a lot of the brands that you would see around, I won't mention them here, uh, but they came from our winery because ours was very fast. We had the technology, we had the know-how, we had the winemaker uh, uh, and winemaking. And so people would bring their grapes from their vineyards, we'd make the wine for them. They cared only for the sales, finance, distribution, all of marketing, whatnot. But, that, but was the the grapes, that was the idea. The idea was incubation, not, incubation. not custom no, but, crush necessarily. No, it is incu well, incubation because we do the winemaking yeah. also, and most of them don't have a winemaker, so they trust us with everything. It's like, well, here, here 
give us you know the best you can which is what we do you bring us trash we tell them we photograph like don't have any pretensions that you're going to have world class ones yeah, from right. this <laughs> from these grapes you know well, is that, is we that way what... yeah yeah we do a lot of them <laughs> because there's a lot of them are not well versed in this industry so they think oh Hagop is doing, I can do also. Oh, Zora is selling yeah, it. Right. Mine is better than Zora. And so they make similar labels like Zora and they want to become all of a sudden, they want to make you is know, that Zora, what drives Zora quality wise. Is that what drives them to you? It's like, oh, I want to be part of it. I just had this conversation with Miriam at, at, at in Vino. Yeah. It, is is the romance of the wine industry what drives these people to you to say, hey, I want to be part of this organization yes. too? Yes. Well, it's a, I'm the well f- until today. I'm practically the only one that systematically we make wine for others. There right. are other wineries that do wine for others, but it's not systematic. No, right. We, yeah. You know, you go the wines, what what not. So ours is a little bit more systematic, and it didn't happen. It didn't work out as a business model. It just grew to be that. The first, yeah, because I was going to make wine for me and experiment with Armenian varieties. Purely romantic, I want to make bubbles. Yeah. Purely romantic. There's nothing in it. So I was, okay, I'm going to make. Then I got one, uh, Paul came, Paul Hobbs, he tasted some wines and said, we have planted vineyards, can we bring the grapes? I said, look, I'll take it only for two years. After that, you have to go. You know, <laughs> because the logic is you're creating your own competition. Yeah, right. Are you like stupid or what? Was yeah. That was, <laughs> well, that was the logic, you know. Uh, and then after that, I got one more good cool project. That was a big one. And uh, so not big at the time, but they started more modestly. And then and then I saw once you open the floodgates, like, okay, guys. It's yeah, working. and then they came and came, they came. Lots of people came, lots of wineries came. A lot of the names, you know, off, offline, yeah. I can tell you. Right. But of all of those were came two years, three years, made a brand uh, until they built a winery. They got a space, they put some equipment and whatnot. So that's how it, now it's a successful business model, I say. Kirsch is also successful because it's the first. Mento Tradizione in Armenia that is done world class. Uh, you know, so I mean, that's so. a fascinating story. We're going to talk about that now because um, brand building is, it's, you've got a winery, you've got your facility, you've got the technology, you've got a ton of experience, you've got, you understand distribution in America. I mean, these are all the right pieces. It still doesn't create the brand on its own, right? You have to create this brand and you have to be consistent. And here comes Kush, which is uh, for the listeners, as you said, Mento Traditional or Method Champagnois which is the traditional champagne method of making wine, which is expensive to do. I mean, it's in the bottle fermentation and disgorging the whole thing. This is incredible. I mean, it's a you see Kush now in America all over the place. You see it as a house pour. You see it as a mimosa pour. You see it, uh, and, and it's it priced at an unbelievable around 20 bucks, I think it is. Uh, it's gone a up a little. Higher. It's gone, a little, bit, it's gone up a little bit. Twenty four ninety nine, I think. Was, or but something. it came in around eighteen originally. <laughs> yeah, so something like uh, forty years ago. Yeah, it was it pretty good. Retail under twenty. Yeah. So yes. this takes time, and I, I have to say, your experience in America may have paved the way for some of this. But how, how do you credit this fantastic success? And how many bottles are you making of Kush right now? Uh, look, Kush is uh, now. After many years, after 10 years, it's becoming established brand. Yes. For 10 time. years, we didn't do much. And you write it's meto traditional, you put it, you sit on it. So you have two, three, four hundred thousand bottles at any given time. Take wow. a cost, multiply it. Wow. Know. Sit, you know, There's money tied up. Capital. Exactly, exactly. So and now you have to justify is it worth it or not worth it, all of those kind of things. But long run, I know it's worth it because once you establish such a brand, Look at all of the brands that are multi hundred year champagne. Mostly are from the late seventeen hundreds. That's right. Uh, Boulanger, yeah. whatnot, Krug. You Krugel. know how many families have gone, generations and whatnot. But the brand has stayed. Margot, Lafitte, Latour, even the more Burgundy brands are many hundred years. So I know I'm leaving something as a legacy to my next generation to my yes. children my grandchildren that's the logic behind it yes we're enjoying it now but we're enjoying it because i know that i created something yeah. one for the country i created something because we didn't have good bubbles until then so i have to put all of those things as a as a person within the context now you are romantic 
Well, like yeah, I mean, like what's left at the end of the day, That's you true. know, you know, we have money. Okay, we do this, we do that. We at the end of the day, when you pop a bottle of your wine, you know, yes. from Khachik village it came, you know, the farmers, you know, everything gives it a different dimension. Correct. And that dimension is priceless. There is no tag. And that is why, as you were saying, a lot of them get attracted to this business because they want to leave something. They want to leave something that... 20 years from now, somebody for their wedding opens it and you feel proud that that kind. Of, so that is why this business attracts those kind of you know, romantic types. But building a brand is, which I couldn't do it in Italy, I could do it quite relatively well in Puglia. I did it very well with Garas. You know, there's no, we can't pretend that I wasn't. I mean, until 2000, I, I yeah. continued doing it until for eight or nine years, built it from 25,000 to close to 700,000 bottles. Wow. You know? So that, but that was easy because it was the first one. Mm -hmm. It was, it was like easy, relatively easy. Champagne took longer. I just couldn't figure out. I said, I sold this much garas. Why is it taking me forever to sell 25,000 bottles of bubbles, 30,000? And then now, yeah, it's in the US. Now it was in Bloomberg. Now it is here, it is there. And now we're getting the, the traction that we need. But we, we have uh, long to. Well, you, so, pick, you pick something A uh, for the listeners. You know, if, you, if you plant Riesling, you can pick it, ferment it, bottle it, and sell it the same year. Yes. You can't do that with a sparkling well, wine. Two takes two years. Two. And then you're talking about a marketplace that's much narrower than the regular wine drinking population is sparkling wine. But how did you how did you sense that Armenian indigenous grapes could make sparkling wine of such balance? Mm, look, uh, I didn't. Oh. Is that true? Or no, I didn't. <laughs> I will tell you why. Uh, you know, because I came. You know, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail to you. So it was the same. I came from an industry, and if you say bubbles, metro traditionnel, it's Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Pinot Meunier, and yeah, so on and so forth. That's the logic. So, and where traditionally it's been in Ijevan, that area, Tavush is the place. So I went to Tavush looking for land, trying to find capital to plant. Exactly, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, <laughs> literally. Well, and then I got uh, this, uh, a consulting winemaker from, from Epernay, Jérôme Barré, and very nice guy, sweetheart with great friends. He came and said, Rahe, stop, momento. You, you can do great things with indigenous varieties. And he talked me into doing it with me, and that's what we did with it was the first year. Uh, we did it with Lalvari Banans from Tawush, Lil Voskeha, then slowly I moved it here. Now I don't use those grapes. I do it from high elevation vineyards in Biotsor. So that's how it happened. It's not like I by design. If it would have been a nightmare had I gone, because does the world really need another bubble that's Pinot Meunier and Chardonnay and Pinot Noir from Tawush? Doesn't. I mean, are we adding anything? Then we have all the other issues, the same problems. Acidity. What are you going to acidify? Yeah. No, I no. don't. I do Blonde Noir from Hachig, 1800. Brut Nature. It is perfect fruit, great balance, and I don't have to do any uh, any sugar, anything to it. It's because it's perfect balance. Wow. 1800 meters. I harvest October, October. And I have phenolic maturity of the grape, but without the sugar. So we have a 12 and a half sparkling that's soft, round, beautiful. Balance and is great. Yeah, exactly. And that one, you know, I stumbled on. Khachik. I kept seeing signs for Khachik. Like, What's in Khachik? Let's go to Khachik. You know, Khachik. You kept seeing Khachik sign every time you go from Adeni. Yeah. And it's a godforsaken village in the middle of nowhere, right by the Azeri border, you know. It's a border village. I went there, abandoned abandoned because no one bought their grapes because it was useless uh, because you couldn't get maturity at 1800 meters mm. you know all the wineries would be closed by then so for, they had for, abandoned for still the, wine still wine yeah. exactly but at the time no one was making bubbles yeah. only still so I go there find a nice mayor of the village Vartan <laughs> very nice guy so, oh we can do this we can do that classic Armenian stories like okay I've okay. heard this one before. So I bought. And he said to me, if you buy, people will restart the vineyards, abandoned vineyards. Well, I said, okay. We started true to form. He knew exactly what he was saying. Um, 
we started with 15 tons. Last year we had harvested 150. Wow. Because now all of the farmers, I exclusively wow. I buy from them. There's no monopoly or anything. I just, I'm, I pay premium for my grapes, so no one else will come there and right. say, oh, I want to make a steel wine from Haji, but I will match by his price. Yeah. That would be stupid. Someone wants to make bubbles and wants to do it, maybe he can. But I also have seven years with these farmers. Right. They know they know me, so they're not going to jump ship very easily. You know. So I work with them. We, we continue doing stuff. So... That's the story of. But it, I mean, it created this amazing brand, and 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 that's two different parts of the business. You created this wine, and then you're like, I got to get to the marketplace, and, and I, like my good friend at San Antonio Winery, they they make Stella Rosa. We all understand Stella Rosa. When we get into the, the nuances of that, but that's it's a huge brand. It, it took them twenty years to do this, yeah. you know, and it's sparkling and it's sweet and all that. Here you've got real class in this in in Kush, and you yeah. now have. I think a brut rosé, which I just tasted recently. Was very rosé, good. yes, yes. And also brut nature. No, yeah, brut nature. no, brut nature. Pretty was much that no uh, extra. Yeah, uh, that's uh, from Areni, from Khachik village. And so you disgorge, put in a, a back. You don't disgorge. A disgorge, yeah, yeah, yeah. With a zero pallet, we do zero pallets. We zero, zero pallets. Zero pellets. Oh. oh, for disgorging the yeah, machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And zero dosage. We don't have any zero sweet. Dosage. Yeah. So it's you know you look it's fruit whatever it's not yeah, austere. Right. You know the brut zero nature in champagne it's yes. austere. It's high acidity. It's it's hard. You know so they they add sugar to make it softer and easier. But unfortunately, with sugar comes covering up the nuance of the variety. So now you you know you but well, you mask it. If you add sugar, the palate masks the Changes, yeah. the nuance of the, the wines. Is, yeah. the, is the Armenian the industry in, proud of this in general? Uh, look, I have as many people who them? like me uh, as much as hate me. You know? it's, uh, <laughs> well, very, it's, uh, I've accepted that as a fact, and I yes. don't I don't lose sleep over it. Uh, yeah. I have very good friends in the industry. Uh, I know how much I've contributed. That's wonderful. Now, Kirsch is a brand for bubbles. I mean, pretty much all the restaurants have Kirsch as bubbles. Some have maybe other sparkling wines. Other sparkling wines will follow. I know. I can see there's a movement. There will be two, three, four other brands. It's wonderful. It's great. You know, sparkling wine is a good product. Mostly they are Sharmap method. They're going to be Sharmap method. You know, because I will not do Charmat, and I've said it, my winemaker said, oh, you should do Charmat, because what you're doing is you're leveraging the brand, but you have a product to sell in six months. Because with Charmat, you harvest in, let's say, September, October, the product is on the market by May. Mine would be a year, yeah, no, a year and a half later, money. you know. So, so most of the sparklings will be that, because it's people who are looking, I'm not looking for cash. I mean, it has to be profitable, but that's not my first goal, you know. And then if I was, I would be selling Pinot Grigio from Italy. You know? <laughs> I, if that was my from ultimate Venezia, goal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, container loads of Pinot Grigio or whatever from there. You know? So that's not my goal, and I'm trying to create a brand. So. Well, the, there is this, uh, my my client base wasn't big on sparkling, but you look, you've You've got Proseccos and you've got Cavas in there. Most of them are bitter. Most of them are flat. Most of them don't have any character. And you've created something, I think, that's going to have a lot of traction in the long run. I mean, we, in my dad's wine shop in the 70s, we had uh, two or three sparkling brands that were under his brand. They, were, they weren't very good. One was two sixty nine a bottle. The other was four twenty nine. Cooks or <laughs> cooks or tots or whatever. Yeah, so, but but there's a there's a un, there's a groundswell of sparkling wine drinkers, and this is real pedigree. You you created some of the real pedigree, and it just fascinated me that you stayed away from from the indigenous champagne grapes. I mean, look at um, the English now; they're making sparkling sure. wine in in Sussex County, et cetera. And they went with Pinot Minier and Pinot Noir. They have, oh, because they don't have indigenous varieties. I mean, the UK, if anything. Well, they had those German know. varietals that they grew, you know, in those areas prior. You could make a dry. Yeah, yeah. But they didn't. They didn't. No, because if to make bubbles in, in, in the UK, the land is expensive. Everything is so expensive that they can, I guess they went with the, 
to, through and tested. A little bit different than Armenian now because it's the continuation of the soil. Yes, it's choke right. also there. Yeah, true, yeah. So they did, and it's the climate is almost identical with global warming. Now it's it's going to be like champagne mm -hmm. in UK, and the results that you try are pretty good. But actually. they have to pay. They have to charge. I think uh, you know Gooseborn or Bride Valley. They're Seventy dollars or something. They have to be in the realm yeah, of the labor costs are higher, land costs, shipping, yeah. taxes. You know, Armenia. We we have a long way to go to go there. You know, our labors are contained. Uh, grape and uh, that is reflected in the grape prices, whatnot. So, and then you, you know, know, your package is from the labels. Your packaging is is world class. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it it doesn't reflect indigenous Armenian character. Uh, it has a broad market appeal. It looks good on the shelf. Yes. It's simple. I think you've driven, you've done a great job of, of managing that part of it. What I heard, though, to this trip, actually, and I, I know that the Russians had said, look, Armenians, you're making brandy. Uh, the Georgians, you're making the wine. But I had tasted early in my career some Russian sparkling wines. Mm -hmm. And I heard that there was a Russian sparkling wine plant here in Armenia. Is that a, have you heard of this? Uh, Russia, Soviet, you mean? Yeah, Soviet. Yes, of course. Uh, Yerevani, Champagne, Ginu Korzara, it means Champagne, Yerevan Champagne Factory. Oh, yeah, and okay. there was, and that's on the way, uh, you know, if you're going on this side towards Sevan, it's on the right, incredible sellers, but they don't make... They I don't mean, make sparkling wine. They, I mean, they make sparkling but the Russians wine. Were... If you want to, if any, like it's New Year's, and it's a you know modest drinking or table. There's always a bottle of champagne, hot sitting yes, right. for midnight to be open, sweet, glowing plastic cork. I mean, it is really Why, it's what? a shame, you know. So that's the that's the benchmark that the Soviet had, and it was during I don't know if it was Stalin or post-Stalin where they, it was a constant decision to make a point that the Soviets could afford luxury, that there was this big program to make bubbles for the mm. masses. Mm -hmm. And that's how and the Russians do drink bubbles. That's that's to no have. end. Their wineries, Abraud and Chabot, all of those big ones are massive, massive volumes of bubbles. The, of Madame Clicquot's Two big markets were the Russians sure. and the English. Yeah. Made two different cuvées. You know, brilliant woman that way. But did it? Did it? The soldiers that came and the sabraj came from there. They didn't have that's right. Open the freaking door, <laughs> you know? And 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 I don't know who it was. I just finished the book on champagne, where the guy say these guys who are looting our sellers will be our future customers. Yeah. So like. Don't lose sleep over it, and it turned out that way. Which book? They, which book are you reading? Uh, the Cladstraps. Uh, what is it? During wars, uh, champagne during the wars, or something? And it's all about. I think how, it's the Cladstrap family. Read that. I want you, I, yeah, I, it is know. a very easy read, very nice read. You really know. There's all the thing about the stars and we're click or seeing the yeah, stars, right, yeah. or whatever, all of that. All of those uh, stories, whatever, but it's basically it's a very good narrative of how they built fake walls so that the Germans couldn't find that. You know, it's amazing and about uh, Champagne Charlie, Charles Heitzig. I will, I will going to the to U.S. Uh, having dinner with that couple. In oh Paris. yeah, yes, okay, very nice. I would say I don't remember, but that's the book. It's, it's about you know, the stories you're telling me are Charles uh, Charles Heitzig going yes, right. being thrown that's in. That's going to be a movie now. Yeah, really, yeah, oh, it's amazing. Tell me about yeah, it. amazing story about yeah. some guy. Champagne Charlie, Charles Heitze, going all the way there he came to, to, to sell bubbles. Yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah. I mean, now we ride the plane and we complain, you know, oh, oh we have to go here, there, sell wine. Their, yeah. their story, the Wine and War story, the book Wine and War, which talks I think about that's the Nazis, what it is, yeah. it's a yeah. fascinating book. And, and the, the impetus of it was they were in the Loire Valley, they were talking to uh, uh, Hugo, and the guy brings out a 1940 uh, Vouvray. And he says to them, the Kladstrup family, uh, Bull, uh, bubbles or no, stale, just the stale. regular okay. Bull, still wine. And they pour it, and they, he says, "How old do you think this wine is?" And they said, 70, 60. He goes, "No, it's from nineteen forty." Yeah. He goes, "Let me tell you the story." He was uh, POW uh, 
um, he was in Kaye when the Nazis came to go yeah. push the Dunkirk guys into the water, and they they imprisoned the French. And long story short, uh, this bottle of wine, the memory of this 1940 Vouvray, was what kept him alive. And so, th- th- thus started this I see. story for the Kladstrups to document oh, I the see. war. It's I fascinating see. stuff. I'm, oh, I see. I see. I, I'll introduce you to. Them. We're having dinner with them uh, on the 26th. I would love to. So. The, so let's talk about the business of wine. We're almost on an hour already. It's unbelievable, 45 minutes. Um, there's a brand, there's a distributor in America called Storica. Storica, Storica, I don't know what Storica, to call it. Yeah. Um, and they, they manage a lot of your brands, right? They manage Kush. Mm, uh, Kush, Oshin, and Zulu. Zula. All three of them, yeah. All three That's of them. Yeah, yeah. And Zulao. They started with us. We were the first. We, uh, the story, the name, we did it together and so on. So he, yeah, he's got a, you know, Zach's got a good idea. He's got Ara uh, Sarkisian on, online. We yeah. had a great conversation a few weeks ago about maybe uh, helping them move some wine through uh, the channels in America. But it's tough. It's a tough industry. Distribution is a yeah. tough business, uh, as you already know. The, the the impetus of this idea, which was instead of, you know, trying to get with Southern or Young's or RDC or, you know, all these big brands and you – it, to start from scratch is a huge task, but did you feel this was more had more chance of building the brand by going with this, you know, creating this distributorship uh, to move wine through America? Yes, yes, I believe. Uh, you know, I've seen. You know, I have enough years to be able to see also patterns. It was the same with Locascio and Winebo. You know, he mm-hmm. used to sell. He started with. Sicilian white wines, and he used to go around. Everyone would laugh. It's like, <laughs> you know, look at this. <laughs> look, he's bringing Italian wines. He cannot drink Cabernet Sauvignon. But he was persistent and persistent. And then he was the lead horse in Italian wines. And that's right. Know, until he sold it, you know, many years, a few years ago, not many years ago. Um, so I, this is being repeated for Armenia now. Uh, it was the same for. Uh, other countries, uh, the the one in Chicago, I forgot, being something did for Austrian wines. Mm-hmm, they were the, for, mm-hmm. You know, there's all this uh, beginners. Kermit Lynch did it for Europe. That's true. So when you come early, so they are now positioned Storica to be the lead horse, and they are the lead horse, and they will continue being the lead horse uh, for a couple of reasons. One, they have a emotional attachment to the land, so yes. they can understand. Vahe, when he talks, or Mount Ararat, if they look at it, or Horovats, whatnot, they get it. That uh, 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 executive uh, Southern Wines and Spirits in California or New York is never going to get it because right. it's just like Good it's point. too out there. You know, you have to find a map, where is Armenia, that kind of stuff. Now, so that job, they're doing that job. Now, Storica is doing that. But he matched it with Savvy. Mm-hmm. He matched it with, uh, he, he was in another business and he had nothing to do with his being Armenian. Mm-hmm. He was a good businessman. He went to, you know, MBA and so on. So, so he knows what he's doing. He can find capital. He, and his goal is to take it, build it, and then who knows what he wants to do with it. Right. Time, you know, he's going to spin it off, sell it or whatnot. But that's his choice. But for now, that's what he's doing. He's throwing a lot of money energy to build the industry. So he's helping the Armenian wine industry grow in the US. He's very focused and he's hiding good talent and they're gonna get it done. I have no doubts about it. He's gonna pull it off in a, and in a good way. Our job is to make sure that we keep up the narrative. We put this all in face in in the magazines, in the Parker's of this world and the New York Times article that mm-hmm. just came. I'm mm-hmm. sure you read it. Uh, did you read the New York Times article? Yes, it was a week ago. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. And uh, Eric Asimov wrote about that. Now there's a movie will come, the Cup of Salvation Four. It's all about Armenia and Iran. My trip there. Uh, some TV. Some TV, exactly. Yeah. So the more of these we have, the more traction. The more all of a sudden Armenia could potentially be like New Zealand where it's discovered. Now, every Tom, Dick, and Harry is going to run to say, I discovered it first. I discovered <laughs> Same way they did for, for Argentina. That's you what know. you hope happens, really. It will most probably yeah. happen, yeah. you know, because, look, 
uh, there was Argentina was Paul Hobbs yep. to start with Antonini, mm-hmm. Michel Roland, mm-hmm. you know. Now we have Antonini, Paul Hobbs, Michel Roland in Armenia. So it's not it's not by co- but the narrative brought them here. I have yes. a lot of Italian or other winemakers. They want to, they, we have lots of French consulting winemakers making yeah. wine here. They all come because they see potential. I think right. you know. So so. Uh, that's Storica will be the the face of Armenian wines in the U.S. So you I'm said it convinced. right, though. You're talking about two different things entirely, right? You are the brand ambassador. You have to get these articles written about you, the Somme TV things, uh, New York Times. Those, those have to come from you. You're the storyteller. But then the Storicas have to be the, the logistical guys to get the stuff in the hands of that. Somebody says, oh, I saw this Somme TV thing, yeah. and this cool guy, Vahe Kuskarian, and and then and they go into the local liquor store and the wine's not there. Store yeah. has to be the, sure. to make sure that sure. happens. And uh, I have to say, he in the beginning he was trying to apply some MBA stuff and things, and then he realized that it's not the same story, right? And, and now he's doing a really good job. I'm really happy uh, to do business with him or be part of the team if I if I can help them find things to do. But at the same time, in America, there's consolidations, there's distributors, the, the books are getting diluted. Um, Southern's buying up everybody up. RNDC just got bought by uh, InBev or one of those companies. And it's a little tougher out there on the streets to to get sure. this. Are, are they going to bring in other brands? Are they going to bring the Kadas's of the world? I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, the local distributor in Los Angeles that sells Kadas, I mean, the guy brought in plastic cups the other day, you know. Uh, to a tasting. Yeah, uh, to a tasting. That's and, and a so shame, that's. Yeah. That's not that's right. A shame. No, of course not. So yeah. it's, it's, it's doing injustice. Better not do a tasting than do a tasting if you want to call it that with plastic. Cups. Yeah. Well, they don't understand the market. I mean, it's not. We're not elitist or anything. Right. But, you know, we have to keep some decorum when you do that much work to get it and then put it in a plastic cup. Is what's the point? So, that's right. Yeah. So is so, Stork are gonna do? What, no, they will do it. They will do it right. No, they way. do it right. I, no, no, they will for do it. Sure. Yeah. They are on the team. Uh, they, it is the, Are they going to the, bring another brands in? Yes, of course. They okay. Will. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, because they're on a growth plan. So if you want to grow, you can grow with the same five brands, which is hard, but you can grow with 10 brands or yes, 12 brands. You now, to. because you also, there's market segment, segmentation. You have certain wines that are for, let's say, sommeliers in New York City, masters of wine. They're not going to do with the riffraff. They want stuff. They want to know who's behind it, what elevation, what kind of rocks, all mm-hmm. of that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. You mm-hmm. know, they want to. And then you have the Los Angeles uh, drinkers or other. There's the ethnic drinkers. That's another category. Then there's the curious drinkers. It's another category. So, so all of these wines have to appear. If you want bubbles, it's Kirsch, you know. So, But not everyone drinks bubbles. I've seen a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to drink bubbles. Okay. But so so they will do <laughs> that. Wife. The biggest thing is that they <laughs> the biggest thing is that they pick and choose the portfolio that they don't compete too much. I mean, it's good to have good horses in the same stable, right. but at the end of the day, you also want to make sure that you don't cannibalize your existing brand. So and I'm sure he will do it. They will do it right. He I say I refer to Zach, but the whole team you know, he's putting a nice team together. They will do more strategic thinking and planning and doing. He, he I saw him at Guinea Fest, and uh, I tasted a couple of wines. Oh yeah, he brought in the Voskovas wines, I think. So he yes, yes, that, he has Voskovas, Van Ardi. Yeah, oh, he has um, Van Ardi too. Now he has Noah, I think. We have Kirsch. Oh yeah, he has Van Ardi, Noah Voskovas. I don't know if there's another one in the making. You know, here come, they look, they pick. Yeah. You know, so we he, talk, but we don't talk too much. He, he did say, he did say. <laughs> uh, I walked up, I said, I get my card. He goes, oh, my God. We had spoken on the phone a couple of times. Who's it, Zach or Alex? Zach. Zach. Yeah. And uh, he says, hey, man, he goes, puts his arm on my shoulder. He says, we didn't know what we were doing back then. Yeah. So this was early on when I tried to buy some wine, and I made him an offer, and they rejected the offer. And, you know, it, there's salesmanship involved in this industry it takes a lot of work and effort, and so I'm really happy that they've that that they've learned those lessons. Ara and I had a great chat uh, a couple of weeks ago to go over three or four entry level things that they that they thought I could help them with uh, representation, in Los Angeles, whatever. So yeah, I, uh, I, we'll uh, get back to them. look uh, if I can interject. There sure. is also 
uh, something to be said about coming from another industry and using some other methods. To mm-hmm. So the problem, if we we goes, we always think inside the box sometimes. Three tier system, this, that, the other, southerns of this world, and whatnot. Sure. But then sometimes you have to think outside and try to figure out what you know. How can we change the narrative? How can we do this? How, you know, in the old days, certain men. Now it's influencers, writers that are the one that are don't talking about the one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and some trends are coming, which I don't particularly care for, like the natural wine thing. That no one seems to even understand or understand what to do. But now every Tom Dick and Harry is making natural wine and Quavery wine, Caras wine, this wine, that wine, because it's a trend. It's it's a fad. I'm not sure, and so everybody is getting into it without really understanding. They make a picture, they fold their hands, have a little dog there, and you know they became <laughs> they became hundred two hundred euro family winemakers. You know they basically started one year ago. You know so there's that disconnect of what it takes to make wine and to have a certain modesty in this business to say, okay. We're experimenting, hope we'll get somewhere. In the meantime, this is what I have. Because if you pretend you're making Krug, you are sad, badly mistaken. I've had, I thought, I, you know, you think, oh, you can go to Germany and make great Rieslings. Like, no. No. There are people who've been, they have records. Yes. That year it rained, it didn't. I've been to Ego Müller's cellar and I've seen it. And then I got like, okay, bye. Hey. <laughs> Chill <laughs> down, bro. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 boy, yeah. You have a long way to go. So now I'm sitting back enjoying the ride. That's what it is. You know, I don't have a particular destination, honestly. That's excellent. You're, you're, you've, well, but you paid your dues, and I think you're accurate. We, uh, we have to think outside the box. I don't think that by biodynamic wine. What, what fa- fascinates me about the term natural wine, which doesn't even exist, you brought it up. Um, and the new trend towards, let's say, biodynamic wines, even organic, they are they were always that way in the first place, right? The the Bordelais didn't have pesticides and herbicides sure. back in the day. Either did the Burgundians. It's just man created these things, then they back off of them and they talk about how great it is. But it was always that way in the first place, and it's not an excuse to make wine that tastes like kombucha, in my opinion. Yeah, right. It should. It, the wine has this thing, and I have this huge hope. For young wine drinkers, uh, my daughter's generation as well, that eventually you come to the table and you have that experience that says to you, there's something special about this. There's something unique about this. This takes me somewhere else. This bottle of Kush takes me to Armenia or this bottle of, of Zulal. And that's what it's for. And I think eventually all the fads come and go. I mean, for instance, why do, you know, bio, if biodynamic wines are so important in organic wines, why are these kids drinking White Claw that's full of crap? Yeah. <laughs> Look, uh, you uh, you nailed it right on the head. I mean, it was post-war the fertilizer thing. It was instead of bombs, they didn't know what to do with it, so they started uh, yeah. nitrate. It was, that's how it was a... Uh, uh, it was a U.S. invention. Let's use it. And now they start fertilizing. Until then, everything was natural, yeah. biodynamic. No, was. because yeah, it's a little bit too out there. But but m- so many brands are natural, biodynamic. If you Already. not natural, the Romani Conti, mm. Schaefer, yeah. Bocaster, all of these are bio wines. But to the difference is that. Rayas, you have to have spectacular vineyards, healthy vines, care for them, do this, do that. And so you don't need to spray them. You don't need to give them antibiotics, let's say, all of, you know. So that if you do, and then you take those wines and ferment them naturally in a cool climate like Burgundy or Champagne where there's no spoilage, there's no bacteria. Okay, I can understand. Yeah. But let's come. You go buy grapes from Ararat Valley from a farmer. I can imagine how much he has sprayed or whatnot. Then you put it in a tank in a hot region. Maybe you have refrigeration you don't have. And you ferment it naturally without adding this, that. 
the wines would be funky. Yeah. Why are we so surprised? Sure you know, funky. you know. So give me a Rias natural wine, I will drink it. No yes. problem. I have yes. no issue with it. But give me some funky wine. Don't. I'm not going to drink it. I'm not going to pretend that no. I like it or uh, promote him. A lot of people come out. Oh, we're looking for natural wines. It's like okay, it's the list. Go get them. They're young kids who are making natural wines in Armenia. You know, or take bad grapes, throw them in an amphora, and now you have orange wine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I still, you know, there it's are, like it's getting out of hand. You know? There it's are like, bad wines. Yeah, there's still bad or bad wines for sure. Yeah, you're, you're, we're all in an hour. But yeah, I do want to ask just one question. We can't go on for, the, for <laughs> yeah, the, whatever. In a, in a short answer, what does the Armenian wine industry need to learn next to get to the next level? Because we still have in its infancy. What, what as a group? It, how do we move the needle as a group? Is is there a group? There is a group. There is, there is a group. We have two organizations. One is the Armenian Wine and Wine Foundation. That's a P, you know, uh, with a government partnership kind of funded thing, but it's semi-private. Whatever, but all wineries are, can be members of it. It's non-discriminatory. And there's the other Wines of Armenia organization. That's a relatively new one. And that's more selective. It's smaller size wineries. You have to pass certain quality tests and mm. stuff. So one thing is the... Uh, the narrative of it, you know, how we're going to position Armenia, that's quite important. That we can do collectively. But individually, we need to uh, to get a dose of, you know, modesty, uh, humility, humbleness, and say, we don't know, so let's do the best we can, share the information that we can. Some of it is being done through genetic research and whatnot. So we have all of those do micro vinification of different varieties, see mm -hmm. what we have, see mm -hmm. what we don't have, mm -hmm. before we talk too much and try to compare RNA to Pinot Noir or say RNA came Pinot Noir, that kind of stuff. You know, it's embarrassing. We shouldn't do any of that. And we should just keep working and, you know, uh, to the grindstone and make great wines, improve every year, every year, uh, better techniques, better farming, more natural farming, reasonable farming, do not spray everything everywhere, yeah, right. you know. So yeah. we have to do all of that to put the industry on the right track. And it will be harder in the beginning, but long term it will be beautiful. I have big hopes for it, you know, with smart people in, not because we're Armenian, but because of all these years of knowledge and history and background that we have, we have passed this on and on and on and with mountain people, you know, so we can get it done. Well, despite uh, <laughs> despite what you said earlier, the, the industry is lucky to have you at the helm of certain projects and certain ideas because that's what it takes. And I, it's always a pleasure to see you and have you on the show. I hope we can do it again. We'll probably be back since Armenia has changed so much since 2006. <laughs> that, <laughs> That we enjoyed ourselves so much being here, but but seriously, um, uh, your your philosophy, your romance, and your interest in supporting all that Armenian wine has to offer is really quite noble, and we everybody appreciates that. And continue. I had the rosé the other day; it was fabulous. Oh, yeah, thank you, Paul. Had this was room. a it was a lovely conversation. Yeah, if we have a chance to sit, have a bite together, a cu couple of unusual things I have in the cellar will be. Oh, that'd be really I'll fun. Be, it will be fun. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how your schedule is, but give me a I ring. will keep you noted. Let me I'll know. Keep you yeah. noted. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Wine Talks with Paul Callum Karen. Don't forget to subscribe because there's more great interviews on their way. Folks, have a great time out there in the wine world. Cheers.